Shalom, Shalom. Giving honor and praise to the Creator and the Maker of heaven and earth. We're going to go over Deuteronomy 28, verse 68, and show where reference is how it's not speaking about what they try to say in reference with the Roman Empire solely. Here is what it says in the Hebrew. Where his sheep kaya means raim. Where his sheep ka. First part where means and. His sheep, the he sheen yo bait. So he filled verb stem from the root word shab, which means to return. So his sheep means to restore. Because it's the he feel is the causative of the qual. Where his sheep ka, the most I will bring you back, or the most I will restore you. This being the most I, yod he wah he. Mizraim. Ba'aniyot in chips, ba'dedek asha amor tilaka, by the way or by the path which I have said unto you, lo tosif od lirota, it shall not be seen again. Ra'a means to see lirota, it shall not be added again to see it. Tosif from the Hebrew root word yasaf, which means to add or to increase. Lo tosif od again, or another lirota. It should not be added or it should not be increased again to see it. And you shall devote yourselves or you shall sell yourselves. From the root word makar, which means to sell. The hit pael, the reflexive, meaning to do something to self. And you shall sell yourselves or devote yourselves. Sham, there. To your enemies. For male servants. Walish pakot and female servants, wa'in kone, and there is no purchaser, there is no redeemer, there is no buyer. So that's what that's talking about, that particular aspect right there. Now, many people try to say real quick that kwana and root has no way, shape, form, or fashion in meaning and definition to redeem. But such is not the case when you go to Book of Nehemiah, chapter 5, and you can see that aspect right there. Now, I want to go, brothers and sisters, into this particular book right here. The Ben Yehuda English Hebrew Dictionary, right? And in the Hebrew side on page 177, we see something very interesting concerning this kind of matter. If we look very carefully, you see where it says distress? The root word there is metzar, metzarim. So that way I want to sit there and let that be noted and seen. So that way we can gain an understanding concerning this kind of matter. Brothers and sisters, one more time. Let's show this yet again for edification purposes. This being distress or isthmus. The root word there is metzar. Metzarim. Now, mem zade reis yod mem. The same word here. Mem zade reis yod mem. Now, Many times they would sit there and translate that word as the word Egypt. But we have to understand, brothers and sisters, that the children of Israel, when they was in captivity, they called that land that while they was under the oppression of the Egyptians, in which you call Dynasty 12 and Dynasty 13, or the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. You understand? So the Exodus itself in the ancient world happened in the 13th Dynasty. That's another subject. But getting back into this particular point, we done seen that the word Matzir or Mezar means distress. Now, in Hebrew, brothers and sisters, for edification purposes, when you sit there, brothers and sisters, and see emphatically, Mizraim, Mem Zade Reish Yod Mem, the Ayim in Hebrew shows you something that's of doubled. For instance, Ozen is ear and Aznayim is ears, whereas Sharir means muscle and Sharirim is muscles, because there's more than to muscles but anytime something is a dual plural in hebrew you have it to where the ayim is used girabayim means socks because you use it for your raglayim which is your feet because you have two feet you understand so let that be noted and understood the proper hebrew word for legs is not regel the proper hebrew word for leg is shok sheen yod kuf so we're going to get some hebrew edification up in here you understand blessed be to have the creator heaven and earth Mizraim means the distress is double, the double distress, right? Ba'aniyot, ba'derek, in ships. So we got to sit there and see who did this prophecy of Deuteronomy 28 
come to pass about people being brought into a double distress in way of ships. Now, of course, there's some who say, well, there's other people taken into captivity by way of ships. But each of those people are going to have to be able to, within their own history, prove that the verses of Deuteronomy 28.68 and from Deuteronomy 28.15 to verse 68 happened to their people in their history. So let that be noted and understood. All right. Now, when we go back to this portion right here, let's go into the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6, verse 24. Now, the point in going into this aspect is because there are people, unfortunately, brothers and sisters, who attempt to sit there and state that when it says in Deuteronomy 28 from verse 48 to verse 68, it's talking about solely the Israelites and the Romans. Yet it speaks about the Israelites being besieged. You see, now we're going to go in this presentation to show how that is not talking about the Israelites and the Romans. Now, if we go in here, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24, this is dated to the era before Rome became an empire. The Israelites and the Arameans were at odds. And it says this, And it came to pass after this, that Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. See, besieged. Now, if you go into Hebrew in your own time, it uses the word Yitzar, the Yod, the Zadeh, and the Resh. Still showing from the root word Matzir, which means to be besieged or to be within distress. And it came to pass after this, that Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cob of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Now, the significance and important aspect in reading that is because for the people, the brothers and sisters, and for the Caucasians who like to say that Deuteronomy 28 verse 48 to verse 68 is speaking solely about the Israelites and the Romans. We have to then begin to ask a couple of questions concerning that kind of understanding. And here's the reason why. It goes here. Let's go to Deuteronomy 28, verse 53. It says, And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee, in the siege and in the straightness, wherein thine enemy shall straighten thee. So that's in verse 53. That's very important to let it be noted and understood because now that's in between the verses of 48 and 68. Because now when we go back to 1 Kings chapter 6, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 6. We're going to start, brothers and sisters, in verse 26 so we can see and gain an understanding concerning this kind of matter. All right. Pardon me. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 26. Sorry about that mishap right there. And here is what we read. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help me, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord doth not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the threshing floor or out of the wine press? And the king said unto her, What eleth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. Now I want to sit there and let this be seen. This is in verse 28. It says, And... The king said unto her, What eleth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son, that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son, and did eat him. And I said unto her the next day, Give thy son, that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. So one of the things to let it be noted, that being right here in the book of Second Kings chapter 6, if you were following along, brothers and sisters, and those who care to listen, you will see that it says that they were besieged and they were unfortunately doing an act of cannibalism in reference because they had nothing left them. So that's part of the prophecy that we see in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 53, which is in between the verses of 48 and 68. So when they try to sit there and state that the prophecy of Deuteronomy 28, verse 48 to 68 is speaking particularly only about the Israelites and the Romans, yet we see it coming to pass before Rome and Israel had contact with each other, something is wrong with their analogy and their explanation of Deuteronomy 28. So let that be noted and understood. Deuteronomy 28, if we will, verse 45, so we can gain an understanding concerning this kind of aspect. Okay? And it says in Deuteronomy 28, the 
fifth verse. So that way we can sit there and see what's going on. The Lord will cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. That shall go out one way against them and shall flee seven ways before them. And that shall be a horror unto all the kingdoms of the earth. And thy carcasses shall be food unto all the fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth. And there shall be none to frighten them away. Now let's pay very close attention, if you will, to verse 45. It says the following. And all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee until thou be destroyed, because you did not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and the statutes which he commanded thee. Now, it gives you the reason why these curses were to come upon the children of Israel if they did not keep the laws, the statutes, and the commandments of the Most High. You understand? As we know, those who are familiar with the Bible and history, the Israelites broke the commandments of Yah. So, therefore, the curses came upon them, as we see in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 11, where it says, all the curses, all the curse that's written in the law of Moses have been poured upon us, even upon us, Israel. That's in Daniel chapter 9, verse 11. That, once again, is still before the era of the Roman Empire and the Israelites having contact one with another. I'd like to show a reference concerning this kind of matter. I have a book here entitled The Bible is History by Ian Wilson. And on page 157 and on page 159, we see something very interesting. Sad, yet nonetheless interesting. It shows the Assyrians impaling people from the tribe of Judah. See, and this is dated to the time when the Assyrians came in, in the 8th century BCE. Okay, so that is one aspect. Then we see yet again here, this is what happened when the Assyrians attacked the city of Lachish. And the people being led into captivity. And the people being besieged by the Assyrians. So let that be noted and understood. This yet again is before the situation of what happened with Israel and the Roman Empire. I keep emphasizing on that for a reason. Now, let's go, if we will, into the same book on page 243. And we see yet another interesting aspect of what happened in history. This here was erected in the year 81 AD. This is what they refer to, brothers and sisters, as the Arch of Titus. Okay? So... Let that be noted. This is after the children of Israel lost their land to a great extent, that is, under that situation of what happened between the Israelites and Titus of Rome. Now, for those interested in the history, you have it to where the Roman leader, who at that time was Pompey, in the year 63 BCE, he made what is called Jerusalem a Roman province. So from the era of Pompeii all the way down to the era of Hadrian, which is then getting from the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire, we see that the Israelites under the hegemony and under the jurisdiction of the Romans did not have a very good time. Now, getting back into Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, we're going to go, brothers and sisters, into verse 68 yet again. Now, as most Israelites know, we teach no one to understand that that is speaking about what is commonly referred to as the Atlantic slave trade. And there will be other discussions concerning that kind of matter more in detail while we say such. But i like to go, if we will, to verse 64 and just show, blessed be the Most High, how it's not talking about the situation solely with the Israelites and the Romans. It says this, And the Lord shall scatter thee among all peoples, from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. And near thou shalt serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, even wood and stone. And among these nations, thou shalt have no repose. Now let's pay attention to verse 65. And among these nations, thou shalt have no repose. So now, for those people who like to say that Deuteronomy 28 verses 48 to verse 68 is speaking particularly only about the Israelites and the Romans, how can you sit there and say that? When it says among these nations, right after we read the portion that said Israel will be scattered from one end of the earth to the other. So therefore, it's not only talking about the Israelites and the Romans. Furthermore, to date, no one has been able to show a reference material about the Israelites being taken into the land of physical Egypt by Titus 
in the year 70 or 71 AD into the land of Egypt. Now, when you go in your own time in the book of Josephus, you will sit there and see, brothers and sisters, that Israelites were already in Egypt and Titus shipped them from there to Rome. Book of the Wars of the Jews, chapter 7, verse 1. We're going to conclude. Shalom.